Hi, and welcome to our first lesson of our video version of our Bible information class. We'll try to keep these videos all somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 15 to 25 minutes. Sometimes if the lesson's a little bit more complicated, it might be a little bit longer. But we're going to do our best to keep them succinct, and then we'll try to review them uh, with you in person at a later date. This first lesson you can see is titled The Natural Knowledge of God. So we're really trying to start at, at the base rather than assuming anything about the Bible or about God, just starting at the, the very base, asking the question, is there a God at all? It's a question the human race has, has asked consistently uh, for many, many years. If you think back to the philosophers in ancient Greece, a lot of their questions had to do with that, the very thing, is God real? If he is or it is, what is that God like? They were trying to make sense of the existence as we know it. You know, this, this world around us, our, our lives here, how did we get here? Where are we going? Does this, this God, who or whatever it is, does he have anything to say about us? Does he have expectations for us? Are we going somewhere? Do we have a goal, a purpose? All those good things. So for a long, long time, the assumption for most people was there, there is a God up there. Not everyone agreed, and that still not everyone agrees that who that God might be. But in the last couple hundred years, there's been more pushback on the idea of God existing at all. And I think there's lots of reasons people have for not believing in God. Um, I think for many people, the idea of God just feels very childish or mature. But I think for a lot of people, it's re the reason for not believing in God is reflected in this quote from the author Fyodor Dostoevsky, who is actually a pretty, uh, pretty amazing guy, even though he looks pretty, pretty sad. And this is this uh, quote picture here, but he said, If there is no God, everything is permitted. I, I wonder how many people don't want to believe in God because they simply don't want to be held accountable to him. Now, I understand that. I've been Christian my whole life, but I understand the concept of wrestling with God's judgment. No matter how long you've been a Christian, Christian you wrestle with the idea that someone can tell me what to do or what not to do. Or the idea that someone at the end of my life is going to hold me accountable for the choices that I've made. Now, as Christians, there's a wonderful answer to that question. But if, if you don't know what the Bible says about God, being someone who finds forgiveness for us through Jesus Christ, then yeah, the idea of God, I think, seems primarily scary. And you don't really want God in your life. And as Dostoevsky says, if I don't have any God, I kind of do what I want. Where do we find God? Well, primarily as Christians, we find him on the cross. That's where we're going. Uh, that's the goal of all of these lessons. That's the goal of this entire course is to see God on the cross. That's where we see God most clearly. We see his heart. We see his love. We see his willingness to sacrifice for us. We see the forgiveness that is ours, the hope of heaven that we have. We're, we'll get there. But right now, we're, again, we're starting at the base and just asking the question, where do we find God? You know, people look for God in lots of different places. We're going to start today just by looking at, at nature. And we'll use the picture first of a building because that's what scripture does. So when you see a building, and we just got through a building project here recently at, at Beautiful Savior, and it was interesting. I'm actually sitting, this office was part of that building project. So if this was you know, a year and a half ago at this time, uh, I would be sitting outside on the front lawn. But over the course of a year and a half, this expansion was constructed. And it took a lot, a lot of effort, a lot of different people involved in it, the digging of the foundation, and just the, the, the framers and people that put up the drywall, the painters, tons and tons of things. There was tons of design behind it. It really went back to architects meeting with us, asking, what are you looking for? Coming up with drawings to try to reflect what we asked them to, to kind of come up with for us here, and then carrying out that design. So when you come across a building, whether it's a home, church, mire, whatever it is, you assume that there's some design behind it. Now, the Bible, as I said, uses that picture. Hebrews 3, 4 says, Every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. So the Bible is, is trying to use that, that concept of design to show us the God in nature. Oh, let me go back here. Uh, Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. I've always really liked Psalm 19, that, that concept of looking up at the night sky, and it preaches a sermon. Now, what does that sermon tell us? It's not you know, a, a sermon of words, it's a sermon of beauty. We, we see from the stars and the heavens above us that, that God is powerful. And God, God is a master artist. You know, God didn't have to make any of our world pretty. And yet, so much of it is. 
I know it's affected by sin. We'll talk about that in a later lesson. But just in general, nature is mind-blowing. I got a couple of pictures for us to consider the power and the, the majesty and the wisdom of God. A lightning storm, I just think of how powerful it can be to watch a storm, you know, and, and terrifying too, honestly. If you're too close to the thunderstorm, if you've ever been involved in a tornado or a hurricane, then you see the power of, of nature up close, and that can be very intimidating. But the Bible points to something like a thunderstorm and the fact that God, you know, harnesses that to, to his liking, or to his desires, as a sign of just the tremendous power that he has. Uh, another picture here, uh, I'll make this one bigger here for you, just the, the beauty of creation. Uh, it's the a picture here of someone overlooking a beautiful valley. I think some of the travels I've had the privilege of going on in my, my life. Uh, years ago, my brother-in-law was getting married in Hawaii, and he asked me if I would do the wedding. I was like, uh, absolutely I will. That sounds amazing. And my wife and I had never been there before and just were floored by the, the beauty that we saw in God's creation there, uh, just the different types of landscapes. The beauty of the ocean, uh, I've al always been intrigued by what's under the ocean. Uh, when I was growing up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, there was this uh, public museum, and when they had this mu uh, exhibit where you kind of like walk down a ramp, and at different portholes, you could look at what was going on in different levels of the ocean, and you kept going further and further down until you finally got to those like pitch black, and it's kind of creepy, and there were like light up glow in the dark fish down there, um, you know the kind like Finding Nemo, that movie where the the fish with like the lights on on top of their heads. So just the the vastness of our world that we have here, and the the beauty of it, even in just our country, the different landscapes you can find in, in our country. Uh, driving through Ohio is different than driving through. Utah is different than driving through Arizona, is different than driving through New York or Montana or Washington State or Texas or Florida, just all in just one country that God puts so many beautiful things together. God would have us see the design and the beauty here and think of him. The heavens declare the, sort of the glory of God, the skies proclaim the works of his hands, it means see nature, see God behind it. A couple things that I find intriguing as we think about trying to see God at the end of both a telescope and a microscope. The Earth, as we know it, about 25,000 miles around, and it's moving 18 miles per second. It's like tens of thousands of miles per hour. And the fact that it doesn't feel that, you know, as I'm sitting here at my desk, it doesn't feel like we're racing that fast. It just feels like I'm, I'm sitting here uh, in an incredibly stable position. And the reason for that is, is gravity, that God has designed this force called gravity that works perfectly so that we... We feel fine here. We can walk around normal. We're not being crushed by extra gravity. We're not floating off the surface of the earth. But he's he's designed it so perfectly that we're racing through outer space. And yet it feels feels fine to us. It feels normal. Milky Way galaxy has 100 billion stars. And it would take you 3,000 years to count all of them if you counted one star per second. If you've ever been down to the Creation Museum, their um, planetarium, uh, they kind of project these different things on the, the ceiling, different um, presentations. One of them has you kind of go through the galaxies in a, kind of a simulation of what we, we know of the, the known galaxy and universe at the time. And it's just, it is, it is mind-blowing to think how much is out there. When we see all of that, the vastness of the universe, God would have us kind of look at him, waving his hand, saying, here I am. I'm here in the vastness of the universe. But at the end of the microscope, we see God too, your heart is an amazing machine. I know lots of things can go wrong with hearts, but your typical heart um, averages 100,000 beats per day, pumps 256 million quarts of blood per lifetime. What what kind of machine operates like that for on that kind of scale for that long, just so consistently and reliably? The, the design of a heart is like the design of a machine. And yet it, it just, it forms inside of us as we grow in utero and then beyond. Uh, next we have your eye. The human eye has 130,000 light receptors. The human eye is incredibly complicated. There's a book that was written a couple of years ago called Darwin's Black Box. Uh, and that was sort of exploring Darwin's theory of evolution and walking through the logic behind it. And one of the points that that book made was that the eye has something called irreducible complexity, 
which means it, it cannot be any simpler than it, than it currently is and still function. It has to be as complex as it is, or else it's, it's just not, it's not an eye. So the, to the idea that things slowly build up over time until they get to the point where they function, the eye, Darwin's black box, the picture there is like, well, how does an eye develop over time? It just has to be an eye. And to go to all these different stages in development does not really seem to check out. I think Darwin himself once mentioned that, that as he was thinking about different elements of his theory, he, just to quote him loosely, the, the human eye made him shudder. Just thinking, okay, I've got this, this theory of how all these things developed, but something like the eye gives me a little bit of pause that I'm not entirely sure that this is how things went. So the eye for us is, is a stunning demonstration of God's power. Your brain, although our brains can be very slow, especially in the morning, your brain will process 15 trillion bits of info by the time that you're age 70. And the different things that your brain is in charge of, just the involuntary functions that your brain helps carry out, and the things that your brain is able to handle, the storing of memories, the location of emotions, are, I don't know that scientists will ever know exactly how our brains operate. But the more we learn about the brain, the more incredible it is. Paul talks about this in Romans 1. He says, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Paul is saying in this, this verse is that if you take an honest look at the world around us, take a look at our bodies, take a look at animals, ecosystems, all those things, who God is in terms of his power and his divinity, it's obvious. He's saying people are without excuse. There's, it just... You cannot look at the design of our world and say, no, no one did this. There was no personal action behind it. From Paul's perspective, from God's perspective, his presence should be obvious from just the world around us. That's the first part of the natural knowledge of God, just looking around at the world and saying, okay, God's here. Second part of natural knowledge of God, I uh, have an example from my child. This, this isn't a picture of me. This is just a stock photo. I have two sisters, uh, one older, one younger. We had just moved into a, a house when I was, I think, six years old or five years old and my younger sister was riding on those little big wheel tricycles you know like um you know plastic ones and i don't know why i wasn't upset at her i think i was just curious but she was on the big wheel by the basement steps and i just reached out and pushed her down the basement steps she was fine by the grace of God, she didn't have any injuries, was very upset with me, understandably, if she's crying. I got in major trouble. But the point of that is from the moment that I extended my arm to push her and it was too late to stop, I knew this this is really bad. Now, my, my parents had never told me, do not push your sister down the stairs. But I knew in that moment, my conscience was telling me, this, is, this isn't good. This isn't good. Mark Twain has a great quote, a man's conscience takes up more room than all the rest of his insides. You ever heard that quote before? It just means that when you have done something wrong and your conscience, that voice inside of you is bothering you, it can take over your life. It can take over your mind that I just, I feel so bad about this thing that I've done and I cannot move on until I figured out a way to handle this, either by confessing and making it right or just sort of shoving it deep down, which really doesn't work. We know that, but we still try it. Shove it deep down and just ignore it. But your conscience ends up being this warning sign ahead of time. If you have the option to do something, your conscience can tell you, do not do this. You know this is wrong and will have consequences. Or in the aftermath of an action, your conscience might really bother you and say, this was a really bad idea and you need to somehow make things right. So conscience is an interesting thing that the, the Bible references too. Paul says in Romans 2, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their conscience is also bearing witness. I know that's a little Dr. Seussy, maybe, at some points. But what Paul is saying is that the Gentiles, are, you know, the people that weren't raised Jewish, they didn't have the Ten Commandments. They didn't have all these laws from the Old Testament. And yet they still abided by the moral law. They still knew it was wrong to kill someone or to beat them up. They still knew it was wrong to lie or to steal. They, they maybe struggled with those things anyway, but they, they still knew it was wrong. Even without the Bible, they established laws about what a person should or should not do. Paul is saying by that action, by that sort of societal setup, they're showing they have a conscience. 
So we would say the conscience is a reflection of who God is and, and what he's laid on our hearts to do or not to do. Studies have been shown how similar consciences are across cultures. I know cultures in our, in our world can be wildly different, but one of the things people have noticed is that across different parts of the world, across time, there are a general accepted thing, set of things we say are right or wrong. And as Christians, as the Bible says here, we would say, well, that's a sign that there is one lawmaker up above us who's given us, who's sort of programmed into us the sense of right or wrong. So those two things are the natural knowledge of God. In fact, you look around, telescope, microscopes with your eyes, God is there, the design is there. And then two, your conscience would be a sense that, that God is real too, that you will be held accountable. Back to that Dostoevsky quote, if there is no God, everything is permi- permissible or permittable. Yeah, my conscience tells me things are bad. But if I can tell my conscience there is no God, you get away with it, you, f- you feel fine, then I'm free. But our conscience, you ever wonder why your conscience bothers you even when nobody knows what you've done, nobody would ever find out about what you've done except if you tell them, well, it's because we know we'll be held accountable by God. So everyone knows naturally there is a God, lowercase g on purpose, and we also know we have sinned against this God. We'll get to capital G God, but I meant it when I said we're going to start at the base. We're just going to assume that there is no Bible knowledge at all. We're just going to act like we're just walking through all of this from the very start. But the natural knowledge of God tells us there is someone bigger than us out there. That this, this all came from somewhere. And two, we know that we are not doing what this big entity, this, this lowercase g God, we're not doing what he expects us to do. So it is insufficient. It doesn't tell us who that true capital G God is, which is really important. And two, the natural knowledge of God does not tell us how we are forgiven, which is crucial. Next lesson will really, really set that up for us. Um, finding out who that true God is and how our sins are forgiven. Sometimes people say that they can meet God out in nature. And uh, I, can, I can learn or be around God just as much as I, you know, fishing on Sunday morning as I could be in church. And that is, I understand that thought. I mean, it, I, I'm not a good for fisherman, but I like fishing. I like the quiet, the peace of it. I like being out in God's creation. And I can go out and, and fish at a lake and really enjoy it and be reminded of how good God is. But fishing out in nature will never tell me who that true God is, what he's like, other than being powerful. And it will never tell me what he's done to take my sins away. That can only be found through the cross. A few more things before we wrap up this video. So what is that natural knowledge for if it's insufficient? The Apostle Paul uh, in Acts 17 goes to the city of Athens. It's kind of amazing. I mean, he goes there, he's on the run from persecution, and it would be a great time just to like lay low, just hang out, be a tourist, and Paul can't help himself. He's walking around the city, and he just has to get into it with people talking about God. He goes to the marketplace, and the people are so intrigued enough by what he's saying about God and Jesus as true God and dying and rising. They invite him to speak before the Areopagus, this religious ruling council, and he, he takes the opportunity to make a speech to them. And he starts by saying, I can tell you're a very religious people. So he starts with kind of like a, a compliment to the people. Like, I could tell you guys are very gaudy. I can tell your, your temples are, are amazing. It was said that in Athens there were more temples than there were people. And they even had a temple that was inscribed to the unknown God. Almost like we have so many gods, but in case we missed one out there, we don't want you to be mad at us, unknown God. So why don't you have this temple? This one's yours. Don't be mad. Here's your temple, unknown God. And Paul very brilliantly says, uh, I'm going to tell you who that unknown God is today. You don't know who he is yet. In Acts 17, part of what he says, make this a little bigger for you. It says, from one man, that's Adam, God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So God's intention by making this world pretty and amazing and big by making us, our bodies, wonderfully complicated, these machines that work in so many different amazing ways. God's intention was that we would look at that like those philosophers back in Greek did, Greece did and say, who's behind all this? I want to know who's behind the curtain running the show. That's why the natural knowledge exists, so that it would lead us to look for God. And that's what we're doing in this Bible series is looking for God. And ultimately where we're going to find him is on the cross. But that is a topic for next lesson. 
All right. Well, thank you for joining us for lesson one. Um, lesson two should be available for you soon.